Hello, people. Uh, okay, this mic's right. I'm always worried about the microphone. Okay, this week, this week is going to be the memoirs of Duke de Saint Simon. Okay, now about this copy, thinking it was the whole, <laughs> thinking it was the whole thing. This is if you got this particular, who is it, Lucy? Lucy Norton, if you got the Lucy Norton version, I say versions, they're going to be translations. If you got the Lucy Norton translation, this bad boy is going to be a three-parter. Yeah. I don't have the three parts. I just, I thought this was it, and I grabbed it. Second-hand store, so it's only like a dollar. I believe, though, this is in the public domain, so it's, I think you can get the whole thing for free. And it's a unit. Why did I get it? I want in-depth histories on the various empires. The, Por the Portuguese, the Spanish, obviously the British, and the French. Now, there's plenty of British history, right? But when I went to go, like, give me a biography of the Sun King, I didn't see one. I was a little annoyed. I'm sure there are some, but I didn't think they were... I want big, long versions. I want super in-depth. I want as in-depth as I can get. So this sort of came up in that search. And this is a guy who lived in the time who hung out with the Sun King. So I'm like, yeah, I'll give it a go. Right? I think I used, I think I used a credit to get it on the Audible. So I was sitting listening to it. <clears throat> the rating. This is a great example to me of sort of how my rating system is going to work. And it's not, it's not going to be, right, like the worth of the book. So you could have a, an extremely good book, get a low rating, so to speak. It, to me, it's about readability and, and, and who all it can permeate, permeate to, right? So if you're very much into, you know, deep science fiction novels, should you leave that perch to go delve into this history of such and such? You know, if it's a five, you YOLO in. If it's a two, you don't YOLO, even if you're interested in history, you know, obviously, et cetera, et cetera. So, so to me, this is a three out of five. But as a book, as it's a book, what is it? As to its worth, I say almost priceless. For what it gives you. Three out of five, because if you're not into this sort of history, which is pretty in-depth, you can just skip it and be okay. And if you are into it, I think you'll really like it. But the worth, why, why, why is it worth so much? In this era, what is it, the 16, 1600s, early 1700s? There's like an entire system of society. So you'll go through and you'll read something about some 100 years war or the 30 years war, or the nine years war, right? Other histories I was trying to get a hold of. And it's very hard to find them. And it's because the, the history itself is, is split and tied at the same time. By split, I mean, if you, if you wanted to write a story, the action is the battle, right? But then there are things that affect the battle that aren't part of the battle. And as a story... They're widely divergent. So if I want to hear about cannonballs and sieges and armies maneuvering, what are the odds I want to hear about like a tea party in Versailles? Very slim to none. As a reader, generally speaking, I can almost see, you know, as publishers also. Like, my audience doesn't care about this. We, we, don't, we want to get to the meat. And if you're into the history, you're like, well, this is sort of the meat as well. His book, I think knits it together for you in a kind of a way. 
Back in those days, they had a king. This one was the Sun King. They called him such because uh, all of Europe revolved around him. If he wanted to do such and such, the blocks were going to react in such a way. So, I think with the big issue, he wanted to unify, through marriage, Spain and France. Two massive empires in Europe, like, they'd be completely out of balance and they'll take over everything. So, we start in wars to stop it. This kind of thing. So, our Duke de Saint-Simon was a member of this court. So, here's your king. Your king can make moves. And around them, instead of like, okay, in Britain, we'd had, we ended up with a parliament fairly early on, but other countries didn't all the time. But even if they did, even in like in Britain, there's the king, he's going to make big decisions and around him are these advisor types, people he wants them around him, right? Like this guy makes me laugh. I'm going to keep him around me. This guy's good at finance. I'm going to keep him around me. A court. That's what court is. There's all these people that just hang out with the king. Well, and this also leads to sort of aristocrats, right? So if you're the king and there's a court around you. Odds are you're not going to have like a common farmer in there. You'll have a landowner. He'll be a, an aristocrat, a rich guy who was born rich and his family's rich and they've been rich, right? Now, I know a lot of modern sentiment is that this is bad. Bad, not bad. I guess it doesn't really matter because it's a bygone era, right? Ish. Or is it? Because back in their day, if you were a part of the court, like our guy is, our Duke de Saint-Simon, he was a musketeer. He went and served in wars. So we have a lot of people saying rich people start wars, but they don't want to send their own kids. He went himself. His kids went. His sons went to wars. And then happened with the other people in court because it's such a small group and it's such an important thing in their lives, right? To be near this king that if they send their kids and you don't, then the king looks down on you. Too much of that and he'll give you the old boot and somebody else will take your spot. New spot, new power, greater lands. When, when he feels happy, he's like, you get this land. You get that land, right? Etc. It was important to them. So we had a situation where an aristocrat is neck deep in a lot of different things and expected to be able to handle them. So our boy, St. Simon, and on the one instance, might be sent to a war. Go to the war, fix it. And he goes there and he needs to be able to manage a war. Movement here, these troops need to be in shape, they need better clothes, fire the cannons this way, don't siege like that for four months, five months. Then he has to come back and be able to put on a nice suit and smoothly talk with society. Otherwise, he'll be ousted, and that's no good. And then in the next second, he needs to be able to write a very long biography of himself. It's three different skills, right? We don't, we don't cross-pollinate our skills as much as they did. So I'm like, you can, you can look down on the system, but it had its advantages and it had its motivations. They were still human beings, right? And that's what, because it's just his point of view. It's, it's him writing his memoirs, but he was up in the court. And so it's not just, some of it is, he's just going to like this old lady's house and he needs to be nice with them. But that can quickly turn into almost what we would call a cabinet meeting where I'm here with all the heads of state and we're determining how to best function this war. And then the next second, it's, you know, these girls were making a, a fuss about some dress and I had to solve that issue. It's this weird juxtaposition of things that, that just cross pollinated to this guy all the time. But he is this great example because he wrote it all down, of, of how the inner workings would have functioned. So you have a king, you have his court, and this is, and he says it at some point, because 
He says, I'm, I'm going to write some stuff down that's repetitive. He apologizes. He also says he's writing stuff, some stuff down that he wouldn't think is important. But that future generations may look back and, and find importance. He's saying, and it's true, that what's normal today, what, what isn't, you don't even talk about people washing their hands after they eat, right? You don't, you don't talk about you wear socks with your shoes, you, you know? You don't, you don't talk about these minor little things. Watches. Do, do everyone wear watches? No, most people look at their phone. Most people have a phone. There are little things in daily life that are just commonplace. He wrote those commonplace things down. And you give it two, three hundred years, and it's supremely interesting because we're so far removed from it now that if he hadn't wrote it down, we wouldn't know, right? Um, dinner parties. There's one old lady in here who, she was she married to a rich guy. She loved him. He ended up dying. It happens. So now she just has what he calls like a, a fantasy house. Inside is just like a fantasy. And she'll leave the door open so you can peek in and see gardens or these great um, paintings or whatever else. A dollhouse, but she just lives in it because she's rich. But she didn't have anybody hanging out with her. She didn't invite anybody over. And so it's not just a dinner party. You see that that's how their society worked. They didn't have the internet or phones or they had letters and in-person conversations. So this starts to affect how you see that's why they built their house this way, right? They wouldn't have, what are these in New York and Japan, these tiny pod houses. They couldn't have that. They wouldn't be able to function with that. They didn't have, let's go outdoors to this restaurant, right? You When you went to somebody, a rich aristocrat's house, it's part of his status then to show, look what I can put on the table. Look how I can feed this, do that. Then we get into actual parties, you know, cut to one. And that's what we do a lot in this book. It's cutting. Here's this. And then I got to give him credit for, I guess, a memory that he remembered so much of this crap, which again is a testament to, I guess, his skill. Because you need a long memory to remember all these social interactions. But then you have to be able to write in a, in a way that gets it across. And it, dude was a musketeer. I'm like, you can't get over that. Soldier, aristocrat. I think he was an ambassador for a second. He went to Spain. It's kind of wild. So you'd go to it. So he'd go from that old lady to this new story. Now, I say new story. He's going to say a bunch of names in here. Madame de this and that and new, such and such, whatever. A lot of names. I'm not even going to pretend to remember all the names. But this is good also. You, you, sometimes you just let history soak itself into your brain. And later, when someone brings up something about a name you remember, it'll click. And you'll be like, ah, I think I remember that name somehow. And you'll want that, want that book and it'll relate to this one in a better way. So this is one you could reread, even if it's long. Even, you know, but you have to like some history. So we'll cut to a different lady and we're at her house and there are a whole host of different issues. Uh, how marriages might be arranged, why marriages might not, you know, um, what is it? She wouldn't, she wouldn't want to marry him. It would be disadvantageous to her. He has, and he'd name various issues and that I talked to her and the mom and we ended up marrying her to this other guy. And these are the advantages and it's worked out great. A different even idea on how marriages happen. And, but you get to see it. You get to see it like in history. Incredible. Now, I mentioned, he was the, I mentioned he was the Sun King because I read this other book by Churchill on John Marlborough like for the same reason as this one. I haven't covered that on this channel yet. I will. I will. I will. But so... Marlboro's here, and let's say this is your story, the wars. 
you're seeing it from a British perspective. Flip that bad boy around. This book, because he's French, gives you it from the French perspective. Same war, same events. Now, he doesn't go in depth into okay, battles and movements. In their time, they had military historians that would go in depth. I haven't found these books. If I find them, I'll read them too. So he didn't give you block A flanked from here and then we circled this tower and this is how we brought it down with this sort of trench, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't do, we didn't get into that. But he's, there is a battle and then he would talk about the various commanders. And again, you see how this, these dinner parties, these it, what looks like just a dinner party is affecting the course of a war. Because such and such generals over there, now this other one's bad mouthing them. Now the king sends that one. Now they don't get along. Now there's this delay, and now Marlborough takes advantage. This battle's lost, and then the ramifications of said loss on court, on the king. He talks about there was a time when. Right, the battles raged. Now you need materials for that. It's it's ninety thousand dudes, and they got to eat, and they got to wear coats, and they need shoes, and the king can just take it, and that's what he does. Leads to famine, and he talks about the effects of famine on Paris, on this city. Might have been different in the country. Might have been better. You can grow your own food. I don't know, but in the city there was full on. <laughs> this happens to Paris about a couple times of full on famine. I think in the Franco-Prussian War, they were, <laughs> I think they ate the elephants from the zoo or something. I, it got pretty bad, but <laughs> they didn't have a zoo then. But that, but that you show famine affecting these people, aristocrats as well, and then what that does to decision making. But it's from a dude who lived through it, right? He, he was one of the people. He had to adjust how he eats. And then you saw how they worked this into that sort of tea party culture they had, these, these dinner parties. It's very, very interesting. But it's also interesting in the back of your mind, right? So when you read other books about these wars, it's not that the stakes are higher, but they're more in-depth, if that makes sense. You understand that a battle lost here means I have to take more food from the people and then it could then end up in a revolt, et cetera, et cetera. And then so when, like I, in the Marlboro book, they, they gather, they move the troops for a month, stare at each other, then shut it down for the, for the year because it's winter now. To me, that blew my mind. I'm like, why would you just stop? He's right there. You go attack or you don't attack. But there's a lot more at stake than that. And for, for him, it's a lot more politics behind the scenes. A lot of that. A lot of this behind the scenes as to how these interactions happen. How the king and his whatever nature pull the pin on this or shove that in, make this happen. We get personal accounts of the king himself. The sun king, I believe. He didn't... And again, we go just back to back. He's, he didn't try and lay it out in any kind of... It's as ordered as you can make it, I suppose. I'm trying to think, who, who would this... It's hard to even uh, give it a modern analogy. I would guess like the president's cabinet. Only you make the president king for life. And you're in his cabinet for life, right? So instead of just four years, it's 30 years of his issues. That would be a... Closer assessment. So you'd, they would hang out with this king. He wouldn't eat but like once or twice a day. But he always had food around him. He made, a point, he made a point to have food around him. And then when you showed up and hung out with him, he'd make you eat. He's like, go ahead, eat, 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 eat. And then when it was dinner time, he'd want you to eat again. And the way he describes it, it was like, a, like a, an inner joke the king had to just overstuff you or something. I don't know. Weird, little moments like this. Uh, across a large, a large swath of society, 
at least that he was a part of. He didn't ever go talk about peasants or anything like this. He wasn't a peasant. What would he know? He also gets into the Regency, is what they call it. At some point, he's alive, the Sun King dies. Now, if you listen to how he went down, it's it's fairly rough. He was 80 or 90 or some mess like this. He had outlived all his kids. He outlived all his opponents. And he ended up with gangrene or something to this effect, where... I'm pretty sure, and the guy says it to him, like, you're pretty sure if he had a better doctor, he would have lived at least 10 or 20 more years because they were doing, like, weird leeches. They were bleeding him. They were making him drink all kind of goofy concoctions. So I'm like, you got an old guy who's very sick, and you're just, like, pounding him in the gut. <laughs> you're just, like, pounding him in the gut. You're like, oh, it's vicious. But it's sort of his setup, right? He didn't, he was the Sun King, Doctors are around him if he wants them around. If he wants them gone, they're gone. And he picked this guy, and that's the way it was. He was very religious. So we have a whole we have a whole solid section on how the Jesuits, which again, from the outside, they just seem uh, a religious Catholic kind of country but from inside there's even degrees of difference in that you could be a catholic and you could be a jesuit and jesuits are like hardcore catholics i'm generalizing here don't don't get up in arms but that's how he saw it and that there were these behind the scenes politics on how to deal with these jesuits maybe move them out in any case he ends up with one doctor maybe not the best doctor pounds him into the dust he eventually dies dead king. So our boy, Duke St. Simon, becomes part of the Regency. Now, these are a group of people who will run the country and help raise the next, the next king until he's old enough to run the country. And in the course of this is, is a good chunk of arranging marriages. And I'm talking on, like, between Spain and, and Austria between Spain and France, right? He's dealing with governmental things from empires that had, from, from, you know, from governments that spread across empires. Went to Spain as an ambassador, got all these gifts. Gave me some insight into how the Spanish acted. He really liked them. He said they were smooth as all get out. You get this a lot too, where a British person will go to France and say they're so classy. A French guy goes to Spain and says they really know how to act and like our people. It's always this grass is greener situation. In it, I think that's the I think I think I would say that's the main gist of the book. Not a long one. I'm not going into into super depth. Now, what I will say is, even if you like to read, right, I would suggest reading this in in bits. In, with these long histories, maybe or a chapter at a time or 10 minutes a day, something like this. Let it drip over the course of a long time in between other books you're reading. It's not, it's not anything that's going to grab you. But it colors in so much history in your mind that it's 100% worth it. It's 100% worth it if you're into history for, for the things that it presents. I was... In my head, when I was sort of done with it, I was thinking, this dude's like Winston Churchill a little bit in that I didn't think one life could get involved with so much junk, you know, so much stuff, and his does. From historic wars to, you know, these alliances, these are things that affected European history. And he was just right in the center of it. And he gives you this great, you know, first-person perspective on it. It really is a wonderful book. I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. Yeah. So if you're interested in this era, seven or early 1700s, you get a lot into it with the way people dress, the way people act. Even if you're not into the wars, if you're into that history, a must read almost. I'm glad you made it. All right. Short video, but what can I do? other than run these ads.
These are my books, obviously. You could buy them and, and then that'll help the channel. I need you to subscribe. I don't sell coffee cups or shirts, just these books. You can watch the videos, They're always gonna be free. Why would I charge? Why would I charge for the videos? They're just fine, I'm just reading anyway, right? Great book though. Highly recommend it to history buffs. Okay, people. It's a short one, but I'll talk to you, lovely lot, next week.